Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Tools They Use podcast. It is Francesco here. Um, today, I'm joined by Chris Dancy, who is going to be diving into, well, we're going to be diving into a range of topics from routine to workflow to apps um, and talking about his processes. Um, it's going to be quite exciting. So if you're, just before we uh, sort of dive in, if you're watching on uh, or listening on the podcast, you can watch the YouTube version. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, you can subscribe to the Tools They Use podcast, which is uh, weekly. <laughs> uh, but Chris, it's great to have you. And um, uh, as I said, I was, I've been like really excited to learn from you. I, I as I said, I purposely not, um, I, I've purposely not learned too much about you because there is so uh, much to deep in, uh, dig into. So um, yeah, it, please do introduce yourself and, and, and what you're about. So uh, my name is Chris Dancy. Uh, I'm 50. Uh, I live in the United States. I split my time between Houston, Texas, where I'm married to a school teacher, Manhattan, where my management team uh, is, and I do a lot of work there. And then uh, I spend a large amount of time in Scandinavia. Um, but I'm probably <laughs> most known for being very Googleable. So if you Google just the two words most connected, I come right up. Long story short, about 10 years ago, when I was about to turn 50, I was a SQL DBA and I'd spent my whole career uh, doing SQL and, and really being obsessed with productivity. And at that point, I was 320 pounds. I had smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. I'd been on antidepressants for 20 years. I mean, everything was falling apart, but like my career was doing super well. And it just dawned on me, why don't I know as much as my computer knows about me? You know, whether it's the cookies or the social media or anything else. So I started digging around saying, how could I automate and productize all the data that I was creating in some way that I could start to make myself healthier or smarter. And it started out with productivity, but then it kind of moved into like most people do after you get kind of your act together, health, and then from there, spirituality. Uh, and then, gosh, within five years, I was unable to have a regular job because uh, <laughs> my boss was always like, why are you in the news again? I'm like, I'm sorry. I just <laughs> It was they, weird. They like me. <laughs> yeah, I just and thing. The other thing was when you become kind of internet known. There was a, like a time, like between two thousand five and two thousand fifteen, where if you kind of got known, no one knows who you are. But before two thousand five, you're a household name, and after two thousand fifteen, the level you have to become known by is so huge. So uh, it's weird. I'm kind of happy that I can have some anonymity, uh, but it's also. I think for me, I find it difficult watching kind of the evolution of technology right now uh, because I think it's so easy to talk about how bad it is uh, and how much it's damaging us and not really focus on, well, what could we do if we were more thoughtful about how we connected and what we did with these tools? Yeah, that's it. And um, that's where your bo the book um, come out. Obviously, don't unplug, right? Uh, yeah. Which, which I think is is like not a title you typically would see in a, in a bookstore because everything is reversed, right? Everything's focusing on unplugging. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's, it's quite a, a, a refreshing take on how you've approached technology. Um, yeah, I mean, the book is called um, Don't Unplug and the subtitle is How Technology Saved My Life and Can Save Yours Too. It came out last fall. Um, you know, it, it originally wasn't called that. I mean, when I got, when a publisher came to me and said, hey, we want you to write a book, it was actually called I Am You Tomorrow. And the idea was, you know, there's a, a group of people, and, you know, sometimes they're behind desks, sometimes they're behind uh, fast food counters, who are just always slightly ahead of the curve when it comes to just noticing outrageous patterns. And sometimes it makes their life difficult, and sometimes it makes their life successful, but it's always something. And we felt it was a really powerful message, helping people kind of what I call study the art of happiness, right, instead of happiness, like how could apps make you happy? What could you do if you weren't obsessed about being distracted? The problem was at that time, journalists, and I, I absolutely loved the, uh, when you had David Pierce on your show, journalists were really starting to focus on just how horrible tech is. And it just, it, to me, it just seemed so easy to, to go that route. And I thought what was hard was helping people feel empowered. And more importantly, you know, it's not like you have a choice to unplug. You know, the first thing you did when you went on vacation, Francisco, in your, in your vacation wrap-up video was catch up on some stuff, right? And you even, you even then apologized to the audience in that video. It's like, I shouldn't have been doing this, but I did anyway. And I just think we live in a culture where we're so 
shameful of how people use devices and software that it's become, I think, more harmful than the possible addiction. Again, tech addiction hasn't killed anyone, but shame kills everybody. Yeah, I, I see that uh, message you put out quite a lot. And um, yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, like I noticed it coming back from holiday and I think it's something you, you automatically go to and, and the culture is sort of built in. So you go, um, is that what the majority of your talks are about then? Um, is digging into those sort of topics? Well, it's weird. So I've got basically two sets of talks that I do. One's called like the Profoundly Human Service series where actually companies and, and big events hire me to come in and just talk about the implications of being connected. Um, you know, I've got one talk called I Love You, Don't Block Me. And it's just about being married to someone who has technology and how you guys can interact with each other. The whole thing is just screenshots about me and my spouse. No pictures of us, just screenshots of the very first time we met through us exchanging keys digitally and, and, and then creating thumbprints on each other. So it's this whole idea of like, what is it to be cyborg, right? And I use that term because other people like get, you know, brussled by connected. Um, and the other types of talks are the more businessy ones are like, what are the things we need to be focusing on? And I think we're at a really important time right now because we're about to leave a, an age where technology has a visual interface. Most often when we ask our AI or some smart speaker for something, we just accept the answer it gives us. If we're using our phones and we go to search for something, we usually just take whatever is offered, whether it's a GPS route or a restaurant recommendation or something else. So it's much more pervasive, this kind of interface loss uh, than I think. So those are the kind of the types of things that a lot of uh, organizations hire me speak about. I do a lot of consulting though on health digital health like how would yeah. you build something for someone where they didn't feel a lot of guilt because they weren't using your tool correctly yeah very interesting and um the like i i get uh, quite routinely um people say to me like um uh, francesco like friends and family just say uh, oh you use like so many different apps and i'm always like p j picking like small things that i cannot remember like mm. a, an app or a day or something like that and instantly writing it down because I'm really dreadful. And people say that I use a lot of apps, but you use quite a few apps, right? And in terms of being able to collect that data, um, would yeah, you mind so taking I mean, us? The, yeah, go on. The number is up around like 20,000 uh, different things. Linking, Henry. Interact with me. Uh, and they're all cataloged and logged. Yeah. Um, you know, when I look at an app, or, or let, I, I don't even really use the word app as much. I'll just say piece of technology. And, and when I say technology, yeah. I mean app service, device, or sensor, right? So a sensor is something that does something on its own. A device is something you wear or sits you know, uh, near you. Uh, an app is something that has an interface and a service is something that runs in the background. Um, when I started to pull these apart, I really wanted to start thinking about like, how do these systems kind of interact with my life? So you know, in technology, when you're coding technology and building technology, we call a collection of technologies a stack. So one of the things, you know, I recently did as of like a year ago is I built a death stack. And the death stack is two apps. It's something called WeCroak, uh, which uh, pushes you messaging throughout the day, just reminding of your mortality, like you're going to die soon. Remember this and get you a nice little. And then another one called Deadline. And Deadline watches your behavior, how much you've slept and extras, et cetera, and calculates your death in real time. So think of a stack. When I talk about applications or technology, I often talk about stacks. So my death stack is part of my spirituality stack. So like a spirit spirituality stack could be, you know, you know, an app like your calendar, if you, if you do diaries in your calendar, right? Um, you know, when, when I think about like a productivity stack, to me, that's pretty much just things that are involved with notes, something that I, uh, a subsection that I call content and data management. And that could be apps like Notion, Word, uh, Google Docs. But also on a productivity staff, you have measurement apps like Rescue Time. Uh, you have calendar apps like Fantastical. Um, you turned me on to the BFT timer, the Bear Focus timer, right? So I love right. that because, again, it's, it's, it's behavior-based. It doesn't function until you exercise a behavior to it, which is genius because I think that's the type of thing that resonates with people. And then when you think about like a health stack, well, of course, you know, you've got your normal sleep apps and all that kind of stuff. And you've got your activity apps, but you also have nutrition apps and mindfulness apps. 
Um, so my stacks really represent like the different parts of my life. And then when I interact with these applications, the first thing I do is I try to find the application that has the lowest friction data collection, which means it gets the most amount of data without me having to put anything in it. And the second thing I really like is uh, ambient feedback. So will it vibrate or send a message to something else? Mm -hmm. So think about Evernote. I mean, Evernote was probably one of the first productivity apps that allowed you to location tag notes. It also allowed you to proactively change the create date. So if we went back 10 years ago, I was creating presentations. And when I would put the presentation in Evernote, I would put it in the city I was going to as the address in the date in the future. So when I launched Evernote, it would just be there because it was contextual two ways, location and time in the future. So for me, really having these stacks narrowed down in a way that I can start to interact with them and they, they serve me. Um, it's not like, I, like, oh, which app was that in or where do I have to check for that? I should be able to just live life and have things just arrive in my view. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. And I've never like seen someone uh, categorize apps like this. And I actually really like the concept because it, it makes total sense because you do, these apps do different jobs, but they also, uh, you know, assist each other in these different categories. And I think some that's a real big takeaway for a lot of people if they want to be able to, um, you know, condense their own apps into certain segments, that's something that they should consider. Yeah, so I mean, my so other stacks are, I have a travel stack, right? Yeah. Apps like TripIt, you know, all my flight apps, I have an entertainment stack, an environment yeah. stack, a relationship stack, a shopping stack. And what's nice is a lot of times with these subscriptions, they get out of, they get kind of crazy. You don't realize where you have redundancies. So mm -hmm. you create these stacks around the types of tasks or workflow you're doing and then underpin them with the values you have. Right. So there's always like a primary stack, but then what is it doing? So it's health and activity, it's health and nutrition, it's productivity and calendaring, it's productivity and time management. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So when you like, I when you around, I can share with you. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'll put it on screen now. Um, <laughs> or, um, but the, you know, when you're like picking an app, like, do you, so obviously you go through that sort of process of, um, you know, the amount of data it's able to collect without you having to touch it. And obviously, yeah. Um, it being be able to connect uh, up with the existing apps, but how do you go about picking it? Do you like shortlist them or how do you evaluate an app? I mean, I, part of the problem is because I am over 50 now, I have a huge <laughs> app stack, right? So some apps, I, I mean, when I discovered you via Notion and, you know, to me, I thought Notion was this panacea and I really thought I was going to get rid of it. But as I evolved watching you evolve and you started making room in your life for, well, you know, I still use this and I use it for this. Yeah. And, you know, it was hard because I'm one of these people because of my technical background, I just want to get rid of everything and make it the new thing. Yeah, um, yeah. But when I evaluate apps now, I really look for a function class that would, is just not available, but serves a purpose and probably will continue to expand. So for me, Notion really became, I think what Notion did was, they created a value-based dashboard for your work. Because when you create a Notion page, what you're really doing is saying, I care about these things. Mm. Well, that's not even possible in anything right now, uh, unless yeah. you're a web developer. You can't code something to say, I, these are my values. And when I see people's Notion setups, I don't see workflow. I see priorities. I see someone's focus. I see what someone wants. I see something aspirational. And I think... Yeah. For me, when I look at tools, that's how I pick it. Is there some need that it, I don't have right now in my life that this tool will serve? And yeah. to me, Notion, you know, as you've done over the time, is, is a wonderful tool at doing that. But so is a lot of the newer kind of no-code no tools. So it, it really depends on the type of tool. If it's health, that's it right. has the right to health kit. If it's yeah. a, if it's a uh, productivity app, it has to have a calendaring function. If it's a spiritual yeah. app, it has to have some sort of lack of interface. If it's a travel app, it has to, by default, have a location component. If it's an entertainment app, it has to give me my data back. I have to know how many hours I've spent watching Netflix. I have to know how many hours I've spent listening to Spotify. Because if I don't know these things and I have no way of understanding them, and I start listening to really sad music, you know, usually your music tastes change right before you get anxious or depressed. 
Yeah, yeah. For me, I stop listening to music when my mind's going in a dark place. And it takes about three months to get there. But I know when I send me music that's going down, okay, pump some music, start talking to people again. Yeah. So you can like, you almost like, um, how often do you like harvest this sort of information? Do you tend to look at it uh, on a weekly basis, daily basis, or and, and, and be able to draw the information from it? Yeah, so it's harvested in real time. It's being harvested right now while I'm sitting here talking to you. One of the things I do at conferences every now and then is I'll just jump or shake or something and then put my, uh, one of my screens up on the, the screen. People will see, like, you know, it's like the Data Truman Show. Um, yeah. <laughs> again, our data is harvested in real time. You know, search for something you want to buy and you'll see how fast your data is harvested, right? Because it shows up again. But what's not showing up is, like, something useful. Um, so for me, the, the two apps that really help the real time harvesting, and I, and I can demonstrate these to you. The one is called gyroscope, which shows me my trends in real time, oh, yeah. uh, everything from apps I'm using versus, so I make decisions every year when it comes time to renew apps at mm -hmm. how many hours did I use them? And is the trend going down? Um, and then productivity, uh, I mean, that, that's all rescue time. And then gyroscope is kind of all the health and wellness, sleep, nutrition, uh, entertainment, uh, and they work together. Uh, yeah. I hope this isn't too much. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. This is really, uh, like, I'm learning so much for myself. And uh, I think people are going to take a lot away from this. And um, in terms of, like, so what does, like, an average day look like? Because obviously, like, as a morning, <laughs> I'm trying to think, morning, lunch, and afternoon, and evening, like, what stacks are you interacting with? And how does that look? Yeah. So... <laughs> The first thing about my life is like, I started consulting, uh, or not consulting, but working from a home office in 1999 uh, for a database company. So I had lost track of like real office hours. And then sometime it's about 10 years after that, like in 2009, because of like digital, I lost track of like just days of the week. And now that we're closing in the second year, I literally have no concept of time. Um, so, uh, when I think about my time now, it's really broken up to am I in delivery mode or am I in life mode? So life mode is like what I'm doing now. I'm talking to you. I'm at home with my spouse. Uh, you know, I've got no place to go. I just have to take care of my body and my mind, right? It's what most people dream of as retirement. Or like, this is what I want to do. Like, if I could just earn enough money, except you can do it yeah. now. That's a, whole other, that's a whole other podcast. You could do it now. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but like delivery mode is much different. So all my screens, whether it's my watches or my, my devices, they all have mode views, right? So for example, if I'm, on, if I'm on travel mode, my watch has a travel face. And that face is really about things like temperature, uh, next, next travel appointment, uh, humidity, um, sunlight, sunrise, sunset, because I need to start conditioning my mind to slow down. If it's a day of an event, I have an event mode where literally I have no information on the watch at all because I just need to be focused. Phone is the same way, so it becomes very contextual. I also use alarms on my phone, regardless of whether it's a day or a night, and, and I can show you these in a, in, a, in a proper screen, but the yeah. alarms and reminders are basically there, not as true reminders or alarms, but they're things like be small, focus on, the, on others. So event days, I have those types of alarms and reminders to keep me engaged with the rest of the world. So when I call up on my mind that I have to go on stage in front of 5,000 people, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I have all of the stores around my house and all the stores in the cities where I go to, to be geofenced with messages to tell me to interact with people or to rhyme me of something important or to share something. Again, I like to walk into information almost like you would have a button on a mouse, except it's you, you're living. Um, so a day like today, you know, you get up in the morning, if you haven't slept well, you know, I don't interact with any of the health stuff because I'm tainted and biased by information that would negatively skew my relationship to the day. So if you feel like crap when you wake up, don't check your sleep, right? Um, but do try to get to meditate real quick. So, you know, I would head in. I have a meditation area in my home. Uh, I have a bell uh, and, a, and, a, and a cushion. Uh, I, have a I use Calm to meditate, that app. Um, but I also take time to read, uh, and reading I do via Kindle cause you can get stats from it. Um, but so it's just one of those of things, <laughs> uh, breakfast, you know, it's a regular, every I eat breakfast every single day when I get up, but not until I come back with my dog. So my dog has sensors. we go out for a walk. Once he's reached his goal, not my goal, cause my goal can take all day. We come back. Um, 
I'll make breakfast. Again, I scan my food or I can speak to my devices. So for example, I'm chugging water right here in front of you, right? So, yeah. hey Siri, log water. So, you know, they're all just using shortcuts to log food and right do. Shortcut. <laughs> yes, thank you. Sorry, I, I, and I always, you I'm, don't always do it. <laughs> I'm always polite to technology because one day, good. one day it will probably have to wipe my butt. So, yeah. um, be, it will remember that you weren't nice to it. So, yeah. Uh, so log food, do things like that. Um, I don't do all the biometrics, body temperature, uh, blood pressure, uh, blood glucose every day. But a week before I go out of town and a week after I get back, I do just to make sure I'm kind of in tip top shape. Um, after that, I usually will have some client meetings. I book all my client meetings from like 10 to one ish, um, about one ish. I'll start thinking about what I'm going to make for dinner that night if, because I'm home. The other thing is, uh, I've got days of the week where I've got specific tasks. So like Mondays are my, uh, kind of marketing day. You know, it's kind of where you go in and you just like, you know, I'm going to focus on all the things I have to do to like get the word out. Tuesdays yeah. are the days where I go through and do media. So if I have a, a media request, I try to schedule all those and answer those questions on Tuesday. Wednesday is always business development. So that's when I'm reaching out to clients. Old and new, I've got a whole process for that I can show you. Um, Thursday is all operations, so finances, um, uh, anything to do with technology, that's really, and Friday is all deliverable. So if a client needs something from me, for example, I'm going to do a big event in Moscow and they need me to get my presentation on like a 60 by 100, some like huge template. So like, you know, I've got to make sure I get that done. Um, and what I find is even though my task list, well, the task can be done any day, by having days I focus on things, it becomes more usable for me to kind of understand where I'm falling off. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not very good at, I always let the most important things go. So for me, the most important thing would be business development, right? So I've got about forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of new business that I have to deliver between now and the end of the year, yeah. and it's it's just two months to be honest with you. It's September and October, right? <laughs> I should be I should be doing working on business development. No, you know what am I doing? You know I'm I'm doing accounting stuff because the accountant people you know make lots of mistakes. So yeah. uh, I don't know. I think I'm a lot like most people when I have the I always call them buckets that I'm trying to keep going. But I really try to systematize that with a lot of, I guess, permission to not be perfect. Um, yeah. and, and more importantly, understanding what I don't understand and why I want to understand it. It's like I said to you earlier, it's like you can, you can be efficient to a point where it's, it's not helpful. Yeah. That's you know? the, the thing is that like, I, I'm just, I'm more like, I think like the, the things that you, you are planning and coordinating are things that typically people think about temporarily like for example the the locations of the coffee shops and places you go like you think of that when you're there because you're like oh that's a bit of a pain point or something like that but nobody ever takes action on it and thinks about every aspect of life so i'm i'm, I'm really impressed at how <laughs> it's almost like you literally uh done like runs uh, analysis on every aspect yeah. I, and what, <laughs> I love that. Though. Yeah, I so and cool. I have a chart to kind of show you the data stack because it, it basically everything is an entry point for a reminder, right? So yeah. most people just think about reminders as time. But, yeah. you know, as we pointed out earlier, it can be location. Well, after location, you have a complete other stack that most people don't even think about, but they use all the time. They just don't think about it as being useful. So then you've got something like environmental. So maybe instead of at a time or at a place, you've got at this temperature. Yeah. at this humidity, at this UV, wear sunscreen. These are all messages we get from different pieces of technology and applications. After yeah. that, level four is activity. So at this amount of steps or this much sitting or this much sleep. Yeah. After that, behavioral. After this much time listening to music. After this much time not reading books. After this much time binging Netflix. And then yeah. biological. At this heart rate, at this respiration. So each one of those becomes a trigger onto itself for a piece of information to intersect with my life. Yeah, does that make sense? yeah. it does. Yeah. And it's, you don't think <laughs> I've never even thought of that. And that's a, that's really amazing. Um, <laughs> Chris, and how do you like, what are the apps that underpin this? Like um, what are your productivity set up then in terms of your day-to-day -to -day tools? 
I mean, day to day right now, most of my stuff is done in missive. And when it comes to communications, when I think about kind of the productivity stack, missive handles all my email. I use missive because I personally like their, their rules-based system. I, I don't have a team, so it's kind of silly that I'm paying for it. But the other thing I like about it was it's one of the few apps where you can star Gmail. Yeah. Most of them don't allow you to star, but star is a triggering rule in Zapier. Yeah. Um, so again, if I want to make something happen, being able to start is, is something that's really important to me for task management. Again, everything's in my air table. Uh, I, you've used everything from to do is to, I loved your video. You just did on, uh, things three. I mean, that, that app is so beautiful. Um, yeah. uh, but yeah, so that's in there. Um, I use a lot of plugins, uh, in my browsers and things, but most of my work is done in browsers for calendar. I use Google calendar. I'm probably famous for my Google calendar because all my data was in there for a good half, five years almost. Yeah. Um, but then I also use fantastical on top of that, you know, cause a lot of times when I need to make an appointment very quickly, it's easier just to type in fantastical from the shortcut bar to get to something, yeah. you know, super fast, yeah. you know, for notes, notes is one of those areas where I'm like all over the map, you know? I love Bear, just the Bear app. I just like yeah. the simplicity of it. I also like the fact that it just keeps a running list of like, you know, you just create a new note, create a note, create a note, and they're just all there and you can read them. I don't really take notes in Evernote, um, but Evernote stores everything. I mean, I'm a clipperholic. Uh, <laughs> I also have like a tag system that's like crazy. I once shared it and the people from Evernote said, can we, and this, they didn't know that they supported emoji. <laughs> 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 they went like, oh my gosh, you're nothing but a moon. Like, yeah, way back in the day. So, um, so Evernote for that sort of thing. I use Apple Notes for a lot of just, it's going to sound terrible, but like things I want to remember. So the tear sheet for Apple Notes, because Apple's kind of a monopoly, they make notes kind of like a default. And a lot of people yeah. haven't enabled app tear sheet shortcuts yet. So oh, notes nice. is where I kind of store things like that. I don't do any of the read it later services for reading information, because what I find that, if I ever accidentally go and look at what I, sh what I should be reading, I felt this tremendous amount of guilt and yeah. like I'm, I'm a loser because I'm not actually keeping up with it. So I'm, if I want to read it, I'll read it right then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, there's no read it later in my life. Um, yeah. Also, I'm a big YouTuber. So I, I save a lot of videos to watch later. And because I have YouTube premium, which is like nine bucks a month or something, by the way, the best ten dollars you can spend for productivity is YouTube premium. No, <laughs> no ads. No ads, yeah. And and save to download. So if you're someone who travels on a plane, having all those videos just waiting for you is is, is amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm out and about, I have you know location based apps. I use Swarm for a lot of check ins. I really like that. Uh, all my food is logged in my Fitness Pal, yeah. um, and I use a lot a lot of environmental apps. I think I'm the only person I know that has a full screen of those things. But I like Sun Surveyor because it gives me the breakdown between. Um, uh, nautical dawn, um, uh, blue time, yeah, yeah, golden hour, all those things. I mean, it breaks them really well and pushes it to you. I yeah. like windy, the app, cause I, I really like to bike when it's windy. So I get alerts if the wind's above a certain level, that's a good time to go for a bike. Um, and I love weather underground cause I can set the UV, the humidity and the temperature and for my favorite like settings for when to yeah. go for a walk. So I can see like the next two days, when would be the ideal times to walk? Cause oh, I, I have to get out of the house. It, am I yeah. sharing enough? I can, I, oh I my God, careful. you're sharing like, <laughs> this is, this is amazing. I, I, I don't like, the thing is like, uh, if somebody's listening along and they're looking to do something like this in like a capacity of it, like it could be like a, a condensed version for their task management system or a condensed version for their travel plans. How would they get started? Is it just, mind mapping this out to start out with do you have like a certain method yep so i mind map everything and i was going to show you how i got the current system uh yeah. too uh I, I i mind map that whole thing so i use an app called mind node uh, mm -hmm. for me my node or any mind mapping app is literally the fastest way to get stuff out of your head if you've never used a mind mapping tool download it right now just stop listening and download any <laughs> mind mapping tool you find because most people don't realize they get kind of overwhelmed, like, what does that mean? Or they see a really complex mind map, but I'll never be able to do that. You don't have to. You just have to put yeah, a few yeah. things down and it creates itself. But yeah, when I'm working on these processes or helping a client, everything starts in the mind map. Yeah. Um, uh, to me, I, I can see things in a hierarchical view, but I often see things in a three-dimensional flat view, which just sounds weird, three-dimensionally flat. But yeah. almost like sediments, like everything has a layer. 
And yeah. very quickly, I can look at a complex system and just make sense of it. Um, yeah. I don't know why. It just I've been this way since I was a little kid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, but if, you, if you're trying to get started, you know, before you get started, I think you kind of have to like, there are three things I think you need to decide before you do any type of productivity routine. And the yeah. first one is like, don't be obsessed about doing it right. I have two posters in my office. One says, get S done. And it's got the, yeah. a bad word in there. Uh, <laughs> and the other one says, done is better than perfect. And I think yeah. too many people get paralyzed by like, what's the right way to get started? And yeah. I always tell people, you don't get better by counting steps, you get better by taking them. So don't get overwhelmed with being perfect. The second rule I always tell people, especially in my workshops, is don't be obsessed about wrong or missing data. Yeah. yeah. There will always be wrong and missing data. If you've got two things counting or two things doing the similar task and one's different than the other, you'll spend, if you're like me, you'll spend 10 minutes, a half an hour wondering where is it wrong, right? Yeah. It's just wrong. Go forward. It's okay, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a difference between no and no, right? Like, yeah. No, and I know. Like, I know it's wrong. Yeah. And the last thing is, no matter how much time you'll say you save, you'll never do anything good with it. Yeah. yeah. You'll never ever invest one minute you saved in anything meaningful. So be okay with the fact that you waste time from time to time, and be conscious of working on spending time the way you want. And I often tell people we need to schedule our values not value our schedules and right now we live in a culture where people are obsessed with appointments and blowing people off which is weird you can have blow people off in one thing and like be upset about missing an appointment the other dude you're the same person you can't have it both ways but yeah. again and think about what you value each day and, and just focus on that if you can accomplish one thing you value each day you don't need any software you've yeah. won the human race <laughs> uh, yeah yeah, you've. Uh, is that too esoteric? Faster. No, no, no. That that makes total sense, and in, in in that that underpins the reasons why you have set this sort of system up, and the reasons why um, you you tend to uh, sort of dive deeper into this. So thanks, mm -hmm. thanks, Chris. Um, we're going to actually grab a bit of time now to talk a little about about, about Airtable. Um, but where can people find you after the podcast um, and after the YouTube video? Well, first. <laughs> <laughs> find me anywhere we're just googling most connected like that I yeah. was telling you, it just pops right up um but the other thing is don't feel like you have to find me or follow my work or any of this yeah. i don't buy into subscriber culture i value the work francisco does that's why i watch him right if someone's not giving you and being respectful of your time and attention for any reason unplug at that point right there's yeah. no need to to to, to like be obsessed with kind of this vanity metric culture. But if you do want to follow me, I do a lot of esoteric weird tweeting. Uh, I notice a lot of things in the news and I kind of take, take it, you know, and reporters are always like starring my, you're like, oh, okay, that, that must have resonated. Um, I don't blog a whole lot just because I do seem to ramble. Um, and then my website's got a bunch of FAQs and videos about how I do some of the things I do. More importantly, if you, if you really want to, you know, reach out to me, um, and if you need help, you know, I always tell people, it doesn't matter if you're depressed and listening to this podcast, my phone number is on my website, call me. If you're unemployed and you don't know what you're gonna do for your next job, email me, I will help you find a job. There are not enough people who are helping people. They're just treating them like followers and this has yeah. to end. If you have the time and someone gives you the platform, help people out. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah, I think you can get carried away with doing that sort of thing, you know, the number side of it. and helping is really what you know it, it is the reason why we do we do this every single and the reality day. is most people don't want the help i can't <laughs> tell you how many people call me and i'll give them a half an hour or i'll, I'll meet them someplace or something and we'll talk and i'll, I'll give them you know, as much time and effort and whatever resources they need and they don't do anything with it so mm -hmm. i mean there's no harm in like putting yourself out there so if you're listening yeah. to this podcast or this show and you can help someone also like one of the things i track is talking to strangers Oh, wow. uh, I make sure I talk to strangers at least two hours a week. People I do not know have never met for at least yeah. two hours a week. Amazing. I can't believe you tracked that too. That's brilliant. Um, <laughs> but great advice. Uh, and I don't think this is going to be just, I think this is part one of maybe a fairly few parts. <laughs> so, uh, but we'll, we'll jump into Airtable now. So if you want to um, learn more about Airtable and how Chris uses it, um, you can jump over to the Keep Productive YouTube channel and uh, he's going to dive a lot more into it. But thanks, Chris, and um, 
we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Francisco. Thank you for all your work. All right, thank you.